So, are we good to move? I can finish his. Okay. So then he says, I think, what is this? Something feature, about feature, yeah. Being in it too much. Yeah, I think you feature yourselves too much. That means you show yourself too much? Why do we care that your, that your visa ran out? Please don't use the hyper local brand because you don't embody that perspective. If you acknowledge your outsiderness more, you could make it appeal to more locals. You can, it doesn't take a lot of words to like, you know what I mean, address a lot of those things he's talking about. Like a major one saying we're not from here and then just saying why we are here. Yeah. What are we doing? And why are we, why did we all decide to lose money, stress ourselves out, and do this for six months? I mean, because that's—I feel like that's a good question. A lot of people ask us, even our friends ask us, like, "Why are you guys doing this to yourselves?" <laughs> you know, and it's true. Why the fuck? You know. Why? <laughs> Okay, I'm a sound engineer from Italy working on a documentary about the city of New Orleans with a six months visa with the help of a couple of friends that are outsiders as me. We're asking questions to musicians that are returning our call. My English is not good. This is pretty much what I can tell you in 30 seconds. A brass band is consist of a sousaphone, we call it a tuba. It's consist of a bass drum, it's consist of a snare drum, and most of the time you will see those things connected to a set drum, but actually people have a scrap, they scrap the snare drum on them, they scrap the bass drum on them, and you have a saxophone player, two trombones and a trumpet, and they make a sound that is so unique that is only recognized here in the Trimay community where it started at from Mr. Danny Barker on to the Olympia Brass Band to Mr. Tuba Fat and a lot of New Orleans greats that I grew up admiring and before my time, the Baptiste family, Mr. Benny Jones and all of them. And the second line is considered of, you will have the brass band in the front and all of the people will follow in the back so they call it the second line. And what it is, is that it changed from being that understanding of the band in the front of people being in the back to having a social and pleasure club actually in the front of the band. And they will dress up in all kinds of different outfits, very unique outfits. They will spend lots of money on beautiful shoes and things of that nature. And it's more of a, a, a West African tradition sort of thing where you see a lot of people doing a lot of foot movements and they're moving basically off of spirit and soul. So we second line basically for anything. If a dog died, it's a second line. If a good friend is feeling happy and he want to party, that's a second line. Also for a jazz funeral, when someone passed away here in New Orleans, we always throw a second line for them. And if there was a famous musician or there was somebody that had a lot of recognition, the day that they die, up until the day that they get buried, we will party for them every day. So instead of us, you know, being very remorseful and crying and feeling satin about it, we will send them back home to God, or to heaven, wherever they may be going to, in a most peaceful and respectful way, you know, and, and that's called the second line, the New Orleans Jazz Funeral, you know, and we take the casket. When the casket is coming out of the funeral home, they raise it in the air, they put it down, they may walk up the street. You know, everybody just rejoicing over how good that person was. It's just a tradition that we celebrate when someone passed away down here. 
Well, in New Orleans, we grew up looking at life from a little bit of a different perspective. When you're born into the world, I've been told by my elders that you should cry. And when individuals leave the world, you celebrate. In most places, it's just the opposite. We celebrate life the same way we celebrate death, the same way we celebrate Christmas and Easter and Mardi Gras. And, you know, it's, it's definitely a culture, a celebratory culture. If someone has a second line going on and they're like passing in front of your house, you know, they welcome people to come in and so slowly like 10 people turns into 100 people and everybody is just walking together down the street singing and dancing and drinking and <laughs> having a good time just for the heck of it, you know. Think of a, uh, the Black Men of Labor parade in 2010. And I remember going to that second line and just, we marched for like four hours. And it was crazy. I was like, how am I even standing up right now? I'm exhausted. But you get so lifted up by this experience. <laughs> well, what is behind these? Um, in my opinion, New Orleans has like a sort of desperate vibrancy that a lot of other places in America don't have. And, and it's, it's beautiful, it's very vibrant, you know, on one, it's like that spectrum that you have on one side, it's like beautiful and resilient and vibrant, and that's because there's so much desperation here, you know, there's like a lot of poverty in New Orleans, and there's a lot of economic disparity, and there's a lot of racial disparity still, and there's a lot of like division between classes, and it's not changing, <laughs> as far as I could think. I mean, there's ebbs and flows, and everyone is, we're trying, you know, but in, my opinion, part of that beauty comes out of this desperation and, and hardness. So you have to like s celebrate the things that make you joyous because there's a lot of challenges here. Uh, you guys can see my hands. Good morning. Good morning. All these interviews are taken in the morning, which makes us like really ugly. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, not to say that you are. Uh, you yeah, right. look ugly, but me, for sure. It's I'm like, only ugly on the outside. Yeah. Ah, I, 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 <laughs> oh, man. This is harder than what I thought. <laughs> The kind of music we play here, you don't find anywhere else. You're not going to find a lot of brass bands anywhere else. I mean, if you find brass bands in the United States because they came down here and stole the brass bands back in the city. You know, the fact that kids play parade, little kids, it's one of the games they'll play. Some places they'll play like, you know, doctor, but here they play parade. Or they, you know, fashion a float out of a laundry hamper or something and they throw stuff around the room. I, I think that it, it's very attractive to a young kid to see these guys in a parade, you know, doing the second line, and they're going down the street, and they're like the stars of the show. It's just you just need a horn or a drum. You know, everybody wants to hear the band. Everybody wants to follow the band. They did a good job of keeping the culture alive with the brass bands and the Mardi Gras Indian, because they thought that might die. You know, I mean, the brass bands almost died until Danny Barker formed, a, uh, got a group of people kids who wanted to teach them how to do this, the original stuff in the 70s. You know, there's elders who are very well respected. Danny Barker was one. He organized brass band of the, like, brass band renaissance, I guess, like the thing that, that the Dirty Dozen came from, you know, the, the Fairview Baptist Church Band. Guys like Leroy Jones comes out of that. Ten thirty a.m. Nice weather. You ready, Sean? Yes. All right, let's do it. Let's go. Hey, Hello. good morning. <laughs> Hi, good morning. How you doing? Nice to meet you, Michele. Michele, come on. How's it going? Welcome, come on in. <laughs> everything good? Yeah, everything's good. It's cold it's, enough for you out there? Yeah, it's not a nice weather, actually. Yeah, it's like yeah. really beautiful. It's brisk, huh? Yeah. Thank you for having yeah, us. Yes, come on in, I'll get the door. Two years into my 
playing career, mm -hmm. uh, I, I happened to meet a gentleman by the name of Danny Barker, who happened to be a member of the Fairview Baptist Church. I saw Danny Barker often drive by in his car. He was probably going to a gig because it was early evening, and I would I would practice like three, four hours a day when I'd come home, and my mom would say, "Come, it's time to eat," you know, do my homework first, and then I'd hit the garage. Anyway, to backtrack, Danny stopped by my house one day and I had the garage door up and he walked over to me and introduced himself and, and said that the pastor of the Fairview Baptist Church wants to know if you're interested in being involved with this brass band. And I said, sure, I would love to uh, if it's okay with my parents. So this was in uh, towards the end of 1970. Uh, the beginning of 1971, I would have been 12 years old. It was my introduction to uh, jazz, really, because within the brass band confines, I began to understand how the musical form worked within uh, improvisation. I, I grew up at the right time to absorb uh, the, the culture of New Orleans in, in a sense, whereas as a musician, I would have ultimately been a musician. But I would, would not have gotten as interested in tr the tradition and, and playing jazz as quickly as I did if, if it were not for my uh, meeting Danny Barker and my experience through the Fairview uh, Baptist Church marching band, brass band, which later became the Hurricane Brass Band. After Katrina, people were worried about, I was worried, I was like, where, where are these trombone players going to come from? Because everybody had been scattered around, you know? But, uh, I mean, like I said before, the, the life force is like irrepressible. I mean, now there's more brass bands than ever, it seems. Their kids are getting younger and younger, they're everywhere, and they're keeping it going. So it's very encouraging, it's great to see. For the tradition to stay alive, somebody have to come back out and do it. So you have a lot of brass bands like the TBC Brass Band, the New Creation, the New Breed, the All For One Brass Band. You had, you know, many other different brass bands, but prior to Hurricane Katrina, you had bands like the Newberry Brass Band, the Grammy winning Reboot Brass Band, uh, Little Rascals Brass Band, the Chosen Few, the Storyville Stumpers, the Pinstripes. All of those bands was once a part of New Orleans tradition and culture before Hurricane Katrina. Now, after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of those guys got old. Some of them passed away. Some of them still playing music at the Preservation Hall. Some of them you find, like the Treme Brass Band, still plays at the DBA and still plays at the Candlelight. Wherever you at in New Orleans, when you hear this, that mean like, it's a street parade. It's time to get jolly. It's time to get joyful. It's time to feel real good about yourself because this is what New Orleans represents. It represents the soul of America. Amen. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, like that? New Orleans, the soul of America. Amen. <laughs> That's right.